My name is Martin Powers. My Chinese name is Bao Hua Shi. A painting should be like a poem. It should tell you what the poet is thinking and feeling, what the artist is thinking and feeling. These paintings represent a very important shift in the whole conception of art. Today I'd like to talk a bit about a very important painting which uh, is in the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It was painted by an artist named uh, Chao Lingzhang in the year 1100 AD. When you open the scroll, there's a rustic country villa in the summer and the beautiful scenery that you see. Well, if you read Du Fu's poems, you'll find the country scene is very much like the kinds of scenes that you find in the Tang poet Du Fu's poems. On his country retreat, he describes the lily leaves, the water lily leaves, as die qing qian, okay? That is to say, piled up copper coins. But copper coins that have turned green from oxidation. So the image that Du Fu conjures forth is of a pile of coins, copper coins on the table that are different shades of green. That's exactly what Zhao Danyan does. So this is a direct reference to a particular poem by Du Fu where he uses that image. Du Fu also speaks of the, uh, the clouds hovering over the country paths. And this is exactly what happens in the second scene of the painting and it goes all the way through most of the painting, there's a bank of clouds that just hang over the country paths. So people at the time, his friends, people like Su Shi, would look at the painting and they would say, oh, this is a reference to Du Fu. Well, Su Shi, I have to introduce this man because he's so influential and important. Su Shi was born in 1037. He was good friends with Zhao Lingra. And Su Shi developed a whole new theory of painting. And in his theory of painting, he felt that naturalistic painting was fine, but it was too mechanical. You just follow the rules and you end up with a naturalistic painting. He thought a painting should be like a poem. It should tell you what the poet is thinking and feeling, what the artist is thinking and feeling. And in fact, there are two moments in the history of art that are recognized by critics, both in China and in Europe. The first watershed, you might say, was the development of naturalistic painting. So Vasari in the 16th century realizes that Leonardo da Vinci created a very convincing naturalistic style and he regards this as really, really important. And it's still important in art history courses today. The second moment is when after having invented naturalistic painting, some artists come along and they decide not to paint naturalistically. They decide to paint for themselves. They make painting into a personal act and they use the painting to express their own point of view. So it was common at that time to use elements from poetry. In doing that, they were using the painting like a poem. They were acting like a poet. The willow tree is common image in Tang and Sung poetry. You often find it in love poems because willows were often compared to uh, lovely young women. When lovers were going to part, the woman would accompany her partner to the bridge and then she would pluck a willow frond and tie it into a love knot. And she'd leave the love knot with her lover and they would part at the bridge. There are other images in this painting that call to mind um, romantic themes. So if you look in the pond, you will find love ducks, pairs of ducks, yuan yang, and also other kinds of ducks in pairs. This is a common image. In Song times, you'll we'll often find these love ducks on pillows. If you were married, you would have a pillow with, uh, with love ducks on it. They were very, very romantic. I'd say Chao Lingzhang. He's the artist is acting like a poet. If you know how to read it, it's uh, very, very enjoyable. Chao changes the line of sight 
as you go through the painting. As you look at the scroll, you won't find a consistent horizon, but what you will notice the line of sight changes. It's low at first, and then it pops up, and it pops way up, you know, it changes again. Chao Lingzhang, he gets rid of the horizon, and you move on to a very important moment in the very middle of the scroll where there's a winding stream. Now, the winding stream was a, a universal motif in naturalistic landscapes, and they had a word for it. They called it pingyuan, which is always translated as level distance. And what they did is they would put the winding stream in the distance and create lots of little zigzags, very complex zigzags that would take you gradually up to the horizon, okay? So if you look at it, a winding stream, of course, always goes off to the horizon. But remember, I said there is no horizon in this painting. So he just pops it up. You're sort of looking at the winding stream from above. Instead of countless little bends, it just has three bends. It's very simple, just three bends. It becomes kind of abstracted. And likewise, the rocks that you often find in these winding streams which help you realize that you're going back because the rocks in front are big, the rocks in back are small. And this isn't just Chao Lingzhang. Other literati paintings from this period do this also. There is another painting which is attributed to the artist uh, Li Gonglin. It dates to the, around 1100 and it's by a literati painter. And you'll find the same devices. He pops up the space in one part, gives you a low angle at another part, he refers to Bai Juyi's poetry in that case, uh, rather than Du Fu. Again, you'll find something similar at the end of the 18th century in England, a painter like William Blake, for example. William Blake got rid of the horizon. He created different space regions within his painting, and he focused mainly on poetic imagery. Well, that's what the literati did. When they referred to their own painting, they would uh, call it Xi Zuo painted playfully. I made this playfully. I just did it playfully for my own amusement. And they used the painting to express their own point of view. So Zhao invents several kinds of new brushwork that you don't have before. And he also selects, and again, he cites brushwork from older paintings. If you look at the leaves here carefully, he uses many different types of brushstroke to create the sense of leaves. Some of them are very awkward and sort of look medieval, and others are very skilled and look naturalistic. And he juxtaposes them together. Imagine yourself sitting next to Zhao Lingrang uh, as one of his literati friends and watching him just sort of his process of thought as he goes through it. Oh, maybe I'll try this. Oh, that looks kind of good. Yeah, I think I'll do that. So he's being playful, he's playing with it. Oh, now I'll try a different kind of stroke over here. If you um, like to listen to Chopin nocturnes, for example, perhaps you'll understand what I mean. It's quite different from earlier music, as a Beethoven or Mendelssohn. Chopin is just thinking along. And the melody goes like this, and suddenly he thinks, oh, why don't I do that? And it just goes off in another direction. It doesn't have that structure dot, 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 that the earlier work has. And um, Zhao does this. The whole painting goes like that. So it's highly personal. Often they will say that too. They said it uh, to Da Wu Yi. You know, I painted to express my mind. They kind of think on the fly. And so they invent as they go along. And part of the joy of reading the painting is to watch them while they're inventing. So have fun with this painting. Thank you.